WCON 1170 Radio and Starvision Cable Channel 16 are pleased to present We Should Know, hosted by J.W. Simmons, an upbeat, informative look at people, places, and issues facing our community. This education-based analysis of issues will remain positive and informative as we consider closely what we should know. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to We Should Know. We're on the air, WCLN, Star Vision TV, Star Vision Cable, Channel 16. We're played it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, also 7 p.m. at those days, 2.30 to 3.30 on Tuesday. We're simulcast with WCLN Radio. Uh, we're just excited today to have somebody that does so much for the county. A lot of times you don't see him. He's always in the background working. John Swope. John, you're the executive director for the Economic Development Commission. Uh, it's been a, a while since you've been here, and, yes. and I want to let folks know that we're going to get into some projects that you've brought to fruition uh, in, a, in a little while. But up front, I want to kind of give folks a little bit of a, a review of who John Swope is, sure. about the Economic Development Commission, uh, the board, the advisory board that serves the Economic Development Commission. It's made up of citizens here in Sampson County. So let's start with you. Uh, I know it's going to uh, be astounding to folks, but how many years have you been the uh, executive director of Economic Development Commission here in Sampson County? It's hard to believe, but I'm in my 11th year. Wow. So I've been here 10 years. 10 years yeah. as the director. Um, when we look at that and the makeup of that, now just so folks will be clear, the board that you work with is an advisory board. It's not a hiring, firing kind of board. It's an advisory board. They offer insight to you. Tell us how that's set up and uh, how you structure in this whole operation of county government. Sure. Well, we are a department of Sampson County government. I report directly to the county manager, Ed Causey, mm -hmm. and of course he reports directly to the Board of Commissioners, and I work with Mr. Causey uh, on a variety of projects, uh, quite often meeting with the commissioners in closed session to be able to talk about the confidentiality aspects of projects we're working with. So the, the real reporting structure is through Mr. Causey and the Board of Commissioners. Uh, the Board of Commissioners, as they have with other county departments and commissions, have appointed a, an advisory board, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, for the Economic Development Commission. That's comprised of nine appointed members. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the voting members. And then we have 12 members that are ex officio, and that's by their position in the community. It could be the president of the community college or the professional staff head of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the volunteer heads of our Committee of 100s in the, in, across the county for Clinton, Roseboro, and Newton Grove, uh, with the county manager, the city manager. So those type of positions serve on our advisory board as ex officio. And we hold monthly meetings, at which time I'm giving them an update on the various activities of the Economic Development Commission, including prospect activity. Uh, and then we also, uh, I'm looking for their feedback, as you say, uh, on direction, on work that we're doing. Uh, then also occasionally we can reach out and get their assistance. Uh, quite often we'll reach out to them to be involved with communicating with our existing industry. So we'll, we'll set up appointments for teams of two of our advisory board to go out and visit existing industry and, and just show an interest, show concern, ask them questions of how things are going, uh, find out if there's anything we can do to be of assistance to them and just kind of take the temperature of how their individual plant or operation company is doing. And I just mentioned a couple of names. Anthony Sessoms is your chairman, and, and of course he's a CPA with, with Denning, uh, Denning and uh, Sessoms. And your vice chairman is Dwayne West. And the interesting part about that is, obviously, CPA knows a little bit about numbers, don't they? And then yes. you've got you've got somebody at the other end of the county. So it's a it is literally a broad range of people that serves on that advisory board. It, it really is, and our commissioners, our county commissioners who appoint these individuals, uh, do try to get representation from throughout the county. And you're also right that uh, we do have a variety of different types of uh, interests. We have existing industry representatives, Chuck Spell of mm -hmm. Schindler Elevator. Uh, we have people who are maybe formerly of government, people who are small business, retirees. Uh, you mentioned Anthony Sessoms. He's also a small business person, mm -hmm. not only in the accounting firm, but in his small business, uh, the yogurt shop that he has here in Clinton. Well, and I think the, the structure, and I wanted to kind of open today with 
uh, folks understanding the structure and the dynamic and, and where you sit and how it fits in with county government and also the impact of, of the municipal governments in Sampson County because you're supported strongly by municipal governments and I noticed that uh, Timmy Butler's on there with the Roseboro Area Economic Development Area. All of those interface with what you do as, as this grand picture of showing what Sampson County is and really this part of the state. Absolutely, and I think as the our previous conversations have shown and then as we go through this show, I think we're going to see how I reflect or you and I both reflect on it's not a John Swope program, it's not a one office program, Absolutely. it relies so much on how we reach out to starting with the County Board of Commissioners, County Administration, the individual municipal elected councils and boards and their administrative staffs, county or town managers and, and, and the city of Clinton manager. Uh, so this is truly a networking uh, not just for communication but for uh, partnership and, and uh, working relationships to make things happen. And some of the things we'll talk about I think are going to be perfect examples of how if John Swope had to be out there alone doing it, wouldn't get anything done. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I think one of the things that uh, probably comes to part of our discussion and conversation is, is that critical part of it. When you look at chamber directors uh, and Jana Bass and what mm -hmm. she does with the uh, Sampson County, Clinton Sampson County uh, Chamber of Commerce, when you look at the Small Business Center and what it does with Sampson Community College, uh, those kinds of uh, commitments to people, uh, when you're there uh, and, and this advisory board, you reach out to the community. Folks need to understand what when they see you uh, in, involved in an event or they see you part of an event or uh, when you have, you have an annual event that you've been doing recently uh, that comes to mind. What do they need to do and what, the, what do they need to know about how important they are in participating with that? Well, the, those relationships are vitally important, whether it's uh, on a local, county, regional, or state level. It's, it's pulling in the individuals and the, the organizations that they represent, whether it's public sector, uh, local government, or private sector pulling in the, what they can bring to the table. It might be a municipality that will need to work with them to bring water and sewer to a site uh, or other services. It could be the community college, uh, bringing training resources either for an existing company or a new company coming into town. And you know, if I, if I pick up the phone and call somebody who's a stranger, whether it's across the county or up in Raleigh or even in, in D.C., Washington, D.C., uh, and I have to introduce myself and kind of tell them who we are and what we're doing, that doesn't work nearly as well as if I'm calling up somebody that I've known, I've worked with, we've built a real working relationship, we know each other, um, and that's one of the great things about economic development is when I do pick up the phone and call somebody, people by and large, a vast majority, are ready, willing, and, and, and able, or we wouldn't call them, to help us so that this team effort is needed, uh, again, and that's so many levels, not just local where we're talking about municipalities or counties but on the regional and the state levels so you, networking is a, is a large part of my work mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm I'm out there uh, meeting with people and attending meetings and conferences not just to learn about what the newest and latest and the best is mm -hmm. uh, but also to know the people who are in control of those programs so that when we have a project no matter what size and we need some incentives or some grants to extend water and sewer or road improvements that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. um, we know each other and, and we're, we're working on a project as, as friends, as partners, instead of me, me out there trying to find who they are and what they're doing and, and how they can be of help to Sampson County. When you look at positions like yours in, in, uh, in local government, and there's a number of those represented throughout the state, and more particularly here east of 95, um, and you think about some of the things that, that you do on a daily basis, how can people be more helpful, uh, individuals that may not necessarily obviously be on the advisory board, but they may just be somebody in uh, Rollsboro, Salemburg, uh, Newton Grove. What are some of the things that they need to know when they look at that and say, well, you know, this, this guy is uh, talking about an industry and I really don't understand it and um, I kind of would like to help out. What can they do from that point going forward other than maybe well, they saw something in the paper? Yeah, and certainly always call our office and ask me. And I, and I, I invite people to call and inquire because, you know, the, the more people know about whatever we're doing, the better it is. It's, that's the challenge of getting that word out there. So they see an article in the newspaper or hear about it through a TV show like this or on the radio, uh, but, the, but they're limited in, in the amount of print 
space they can do or, to, or time on electronic media. So first, always feel free to give me a reach out and call. Second, um, really pay attention to what's being said. And, and I don't mean that as the people aren't paying attention, but these can be fairly complicated matters. So when we're talking with the Board of Commissioners on incentives, it's very easy to take the short picture of it and not really understand the full depth of why incentives are being discussed or how they're going to work, but also listen to what, what the county's benefits are or to the region, uh, how the, these projects are going to benefit the region. And, and, you know, look at the big picture because, again, we all have opinions of whether it's incentives or other aspects of business or the public sector, private sector, but keep an open mind, listen to the, the, the total picture, and learn exactly what, see as much as you can, find out uh, what, the, what, as I say, the big picture is. And a lot of times when you, when you hear people talk about economic development and, and they talk about your seat particularly and they talk about maybe the the commission or, or advisory board or what have you it boils down to them to jobs and the sense of is this going to bring jobs and is it going to be 10 jobs 20 jobs 50 jobs whatever what how do you explain to folks sometimes that, that these things take quite a bit of time for you to develop uh, it's not it's not as though you, you walk out somewhere to some other area of the state or go on the computer and there's a smorgasbord of things and you just choose from it. It's, it takes culturing over time, does it not? It, it certainly does. The, you know, the first step in, in economic development recruitment is, is having good relationships with those entities that can bring us prospects. So whether it's the North Carolina Department of Commerce or national site location consultants that are hired by companies that find new locations, uh, regional economic development programs. So there's, there's a myriad of, of different uh, organizations that have first contact from companies and, and then these organizations say, well, you need to go look at Sampson County or look at Duplin County or look over in Wake County. And of course, at all, you get the attention by what you have to offer. So if it's a company that is high tech and, and needs to be in a research triangle park, that's yeah. where they're going to go look. Yeah. But if, if it's a company that needs a kind of building we might have available or site or our location or another other factors that we have that are our strengths, um, then we get their attention. So that's that first step is being on the radar screen. Second one is uh, offering a good product that can get their attention. And what it really all starts with available sites and available buildings. Well, we're going to take a break, and John, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking with John Swope. Stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You're listening to We Should Know on WCLN Radio, Star Vision TV. If you're watching us, Star Vision TV Channel 16 and Star Vision Cable Channel 16. We come to you on Tuesday, 2.30 to 3.30 each and every Tuesday. Also at 7 p.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, a replay. And there's a reprint in the Samson Weekly newspaper. You can pick that up on Thursdays and get a summation of the show today. We're talking with John Swope. John is the Executive Director of the Economic Development Commission here in Sandstone County. John, thank you for being with us. We're talking about some of the kinds of uh, intricate details, talking about a little bit about John and the fact that you've been there over 10 years now. And uh, a lot of folks kind of in my age, genre will think about that and go, wow, what happens to time? And I know you and I have talked about that a lot. We talk about economic development. We, we talk about a lot of things that relate to that as it impacts a job. And we've spent some time talking about how important people is. But there's other things that impact that as well, and some of the things that we have heard over time, and, and I don't want to necessarily just repeat a lot of this stuff, but education we know is very important. You mentioned a while ago that some jobs, some industry, obviously if they're looking at a specific location, they may look to a uh, research triangle, and there's no need for you to get involved in that because a lot of times these folks are what, high-level um, engineers and that kind of thing. We just don't have a mass supply of those, do we? That's correct. You know, highly technical people could be in life sciences or engineering. Uh, so, the, you know, that's why the Research Triangle Park was created back in the late 1950s was to be a resource such as Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. where many high tech companies can come and 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 use each other, help each other, uh, to, and grow off of each other. So, but not all companies need to or want to be in a research triangle park. So that, that we're competing for a lot of the companies that are looking in the southeast United States and and uh, looking for the type of resources that a rural area such as Sampson County can bring. 
One of the things that's always interested me is, is there, there is a literally a parallel, a tie-in to everything. And, and as you were talking, the, the thing that struck me as well is, is health care and how that ties into economic development. Uh, it's just a few weeks ago we had the, the outgoing CEO of Sampson Regional Medical Center on, and we talked about a number of issues at Sampson Regional. When folks are, are coming to you and they're looking in an area, uh, do they also have in their file a number of other areas they're looking at? And how important is health care as it relates to an industry coming here? Absolutely. Uh, they are looking at other areas. We are in competition on all projects. Uh, what they typically will do is have a, a two list. One is absolute needs that the project they need to have and then wants things that they prefer to have. So they go through those two lists. Uh, we compete with other counties as they're checking off those lists. Uh, they, that could comprise of multiple visits. Uh, in the end, they'll sh narrow it down to a short list of it could be three, five, maybe even or more uh, communities or counties that they're giving ser very serious consideration for. As they go through that list, there's really two sides of it. One is on the more site or building specific, the, the manufacturing plant specific or whatever type of operation. So it's you know looking at the size of a site or size of a building, the infrastructure, water, sewer, gas, electricity, telecom, uh, looking at all those aspects that serve the plant. Then the other side of it is that all the aspects that serve the individuals that work within that plant. So whether they're recruiting management or technical people in or they're hiring local people, they want to see what the, you might say, quality of life is for a community. So that health care is very important, education, recreation. Uh, in our business, the quiet, and you probably have heard this in, in other uh, business sectors, the windshield tour. So whether they're riding around with me or they often will come into a community on their own, they're riding around your community. If they see it's a, a well-kept, clean, the yards are nicely kept, your, your church churches, local churches are, are freshly painted or they look good, you know, the yards are kept well, your governmental facilities are look well maintained, that's impressive. But if you get to a community that's a little trashy, uh, people aren't keeping their yards, uh, it just isn't very appealing and, and you know, not all communities are as nice as ours. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're very fortunate that in our lo localities that have good leadership and good management in our communities. Uh, but, but that's an important part. So that, that quality of life side mm -hmm. is very important. I think an example of that is what we've seen on the national media with Detroit and uh, what's happening in that city and some of the blighted areas up there. It's just really uh, horrible in some of those areas and, and to attract people in, it makes it problematic. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're, we're fortunate that we have leadership um, and management of our localities that, that are working hard to, and of course it's not just to attract new companies, it's for the citizens that are here. They're really doing that first. They're serving their existing citizens and a side benefit of keeping and maintaining good communities is that you, you look attractive recruiting new companies. And oftentimes we don't pay attention to that just as a, a person in the community of how critical that is to your job and getting industry and, and business here. Absolutely. Let's talk about education for a minute. Oftentimes we get a, a kind of a one focus view of education. You mentioned part of that then. But education itself as the education level of the community. I know the college constantly works on trying to improve the reading uh, level. <clears throat> Tell us about education and how critical that is to the function of bringing certain types of industry into the community. Well, you know, there's there's almost no, uh, very little examples of low-tech industry anymore. Even products or processes that you think might be low-tech, there's a computer involved or there's, there's automated equipment and uh, there's measuring equipment. So education is so vitally important. And as we've seen in the last 10, 15 years, how things change so quickly. So the technology that, that you're seeing, maybe in a retail establishment, look at a cash register, how it's changed over the last 10 years, uh, the same way with manufacturing. So our, our companies need employees that can be trained and retrained in a few years and retrained in another few years, whether on the same piece of equipment that's gotten more modern, more efficient, and, and they need new training, or they need to be flexible and be able to move over to another job so that they can learn the skills that are needed for that job, including how to operate quite often high-tech equipment. So education is vitally important. And then it also boils down to we want to remember that whether it's a local person working at a company or if you're recruiting families in, 
how are their children being educated? Because, you know, if, if you're looking at moving to a community, that's the first thing a parent goes looks at. They look at the house and they ask, what school district is this in? And tell me about the schools. So how the like, local children and children that could be moved in, what's their experience going to be in the education system? And how, when they come out, what, are, what opportunities is going to provide to them? So education is, is critically important in all aspects of, of any community. Quite frankly, oftentimes you, you, you'll hear this conversation that an industry is coming to town or that recruiting for an industry that you have to look at education in the sense of it, is it a box moving industry, is it something that people do as manual labor or is it, is it high tech. So basically what I hear you saying is that not only do we need to be training and educating folks for those high tech jobs, but even the box moving jobs are going to high tech because I understand a lot of robot kind of technology is taking the place of what we used to look at as box moving jobs. Absolutely. And you know something else and, and JW from your background many years in education you know this, but the the work ethic of the of the population is is critically important. And I and I hate to say this, but in the United States and we may not be alone around the world, but it seems like it's hard getting harder and harder to find workers that are going to be the type that a company needs, that are going to show up to work, that, and I hate to say this, that they will be drug free, that will be reliable, that have the ability to be trained, and then in a few years retrained for those good jobs. And, and let me give a plug out there for manufacturing, because a lot of people over the, you know, over the last 20, 30 years in our lifetime, we've kind of gotten away from manufacturing being thought of as an attractive uh, field for a career. But, but it is very attractive because manufacturers pay more. They often typically offer benefits. They are typically stable, even though the general perception is they come and go. They really don't. Look around your community, and we may see a company leave, but look at all the other companies that have been here for decades. Uh, so they tend to be more stable. Um, so manufacturing is an attractive uh, course of work for an individual. So we need to get education at all levels to refocus on the, the, the technical skill side. And I'll tell you, if you're a young person and you get a technical skill or a medical skill, not that I want them to leave Sampson County, but you have mobility. Because if you have a job that's in demand, if you decide to move to Charlotte or to move to Fayetteville, you've got a skill that you can probably find a job. But if you decide to stay here, and that's what we want, uh, you're in demand. So the local companies are looking for skilled people, and, and you bring a, you're an asset to them, and they're going to want to keep you. Well, when, when we look at that and we think about those skilled labor jobs, oftentimes their eyes turn toward the community college. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, a, and a number of folks, and of course I've had uh, Dr. Hutchins on, and we've talked about different issues, but with your job and what you do, how critical is that community college in your area? Absolutely. Uh, the, our community college, Sampson Community College, and across the state of North Carolina, the, I believe, 57 community colleges. That's one of the great things that the state of North Carolina has done uh, in the modern area is back in the 50s and in, through the 60s established a community college system in North Carolina. Uh, and I believe the mantra is that uh, no citizen of the state will have to travel more than, I think it's 30 miles to get to a community college. And we're a big state. Absolutely. And so that means we're a lot of geographic to cover. But that is really what allowed one of the things that allowed North Carolina to move into a, uh, the era of being a manufacturing state so that companies, whether they're existing or again new, can, can create jobs and the, the community college system and here at Sampson Community College, which as you well know can call on the resources of the statewide community college system and we often do, um, that, that they can set up customized training for what the skills are that that plant needs, uh, whether again whether they're existing or new companies coming in. And, and I think sometimes we don't realize that, again, what I'm trying to do is for folks to see from your eyes what, what's going on here. We don't understand the importance of those education pieces on the skill level sets. Uh, but when we come back from break, I want to talk a bit more about this whole work ethic issue because I think it's critically important to communities and as equally important as how well the community looks is our ability to have a workforce ready to go to work. So uh, let's think about that. Uh, we're going to take a break and we'll come back in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with John Swope. He's the economic developer here in Sampson County. Uh, and it's uh, our pleasure to have John because he comes with a world of information for us. I want you to stay tuned because we're going to talk about some 
uh, manufacturing, some businesses, uh, some firms that has been brought in from the last time we talked to him, which has been a few months now. So stay with us as we continue this conversation with John Swope. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We should know it's on the air. I want to thank Nicole for her introductions to this show each and every week. We're coming to you on WCLN Radio, Star Vision TV, Star Vision Cable Channel 16. Also want to give a shout out to a number of folks on the radio that mention their show each and every week. The uh, early show there with uh, L Man, Nolan Z, and Grandpa. Also Wayne Weeks with the Gospel Hour talks about our show occasionally there. And Don Smith with the Country Store, a popular show. Don with, uh, last time I talked with Don, I think it was over 50 years of radio experience. And, of course, Robert Stroud with the Boogie Shoes Radio Network every Saturday. want to thank Robert for mentioning We Should Know on his show. And also he kind of lets you know some of the guests we have upcoming for the following week. And Tommy the Fly uh, that's always out there buzzing around telling folks what's going on and, and speaking about We Should Know. Uh, today we're talking with John Swope, the Executive Director for the Economic Development here in the area in Sampson County. And John, almost when I say John Swope for Sampson County, it's more of an area thing because you guys communicate and talk with each other all the time. As we went to break, we were talking about some challenges. One of the things I wanted to mention, and we talked about uh, work and work ethic, uh, we have a, a huge uh, Latino population. Uh, immigration is, is something that I know is being looked at on the national level. And you and I are not going to get into the politics of it, but certainly it's something that I, I think is a force that, that you reckon with every day because uh, a lot of these folks I know and uh, I consider friends there, and they, you talk about work ethic. These people will work circles around well, anything I know, I'm there. There's just dedicated family people, very quick to learn, very intelligent, and and they are strong work ethic people. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's they, they're coming here for an opportunity. Just and that's how America got started: mm -hmm. is people coming from other parts of the world for an opportunity, uh, a variety of different types of opportunity. But uh, you know, this country does provide. Uh, just that to individuals is opportunity for them in, an individual to to improve themselves, to provide for their families, to provide a future for their children. Uh, that's that's very endearing, mm -hmm. um, and a part of that is is uh, employment opportunities or or maybe the opportunity to start their own small business. One of the things that often uh, is is an important area for economic development, and I was talking with Senator Brent Jackson. Uh, uh, recently and in that discussion one of the things that he has moved forward and aggressively with in the legislature of North Carolina is removing restrictive regulations. Uh, how do we stand in this area as it relates to other areas that you're familiar with uh, concerning regulations that may be impediments uh, to industry? Is, is our regulatory process in pretty good shape? When it, uh, when it pertains to uh, an industry coming here, are there things that kind of shuts the door on some industry that may come here, but regulations would prevent them from coming here? Well, North Carolina's pretty good at it. Uh, we do have, you know, we do have a lot of regulations, uh, and I would say most of them come down from the federal government, to be mm -hmm. quite honest, mm -hmm. uh, and they are um, inhibiting to a point, but North Carolina does try. So when you look at our various state agencies, um, they are working, and this new administration, you do hear from them an emphasis to be more business friendly. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't appear to be giving anything away. They're not lessening the regulations, but they're also being more business friendly. And I'm not talking about just for large corporations, uh, any small business. And so you see, uh, and this isn't anything new, but you do see uh, fairly aggressiveness over the last few years at the NC Department of Commerce or the North Carolina Department of Environmental and Natural Resources or the Department of Revenue. They've set up programs or offices uh, such as the North Carolina Department of Commerce. They mm -hmm. have uh, a 800 line called North Carolina Blink, mm -hmm. which you can call into and ask just about any question that's uh, primarily around, around business, but, but also training and, and they're a good resource for people out in the state to, to as a starting point, where do I go to? Because mm -hmm. our office and, and other, other county and municipal offices get calls all the time, how do I do this or how do I do that? So we do see state agencies and local agencies. Uh, we have uh, working hard to be customer service friendly. In, in Sampson County, our department heads re meet fairly regularly, and several years ago we made it an emphasis that we're going to try very hard that when somebody calls, that we're not putting them on hold and then putting them to somebody else 
and then they're put on to somebody else, and then they're put on to someone. No, our goal is to, when I get a call, and I, we, our office quite often gets calls that people are misdirected, so they're really calling in the wrong location, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but our goal is to get them to, to correct the person or phone number for one call so that they don't have to keep calling around. That's not always easy, but, but it's, it's that customer service that if we can provide a quick turnaround for them and, and not give them the frustration that we all have occasionally when we're calling an 800 number or some type of customer service, we, we all have that experience. So we're trying not to do that, and that's just not at Sampson County, but I'm sure all our localities as well as at the state level. One of the things when you mentioned that it came to mind, and I had a little note. Uh, do, does folks come oftentimes unannounced and do uh, what I would call scouting missions in certain areas, and maybe you don't even know about it, and they're just doing kind of a ride through, or they may stop at the local eatery or what have you, and, and just scout around in the community unannounced, unknown uh, to you or anybody else. Does that really happen? They do, and it, you know, it's changed over time. Uh, back in the, the, the old days of economic development, they were almost totally relied on us at the local and state level to provide them information. So they would call the NC State Department of Commerce or, or Sampson County developer and ask for a research and demographics. But today with the computers, they can do a, a tremendous amount of research from their offices. They don't even have to leave. And uh, they, they, there's a number of databases, including our own. Mm -hmm. Our own website is a database with sites and buildings and demographics mm -hmm. and statistics. Now, they do also come to a community and do that kind of windshield tour. So if they're looking at a community, especially um, if they're sensitive to uh, what, how their employees are going to be uh, receptive to moving to a community or or to, just depending on a number of factors, they will go in and sit down in a restaurant and, and ask the, the, the person serving them, how are you today? How's things in your community? It seems like a nice community. And if they give a pleasant response, and, and, and which, which most people are that way, yeah. um, then that's very it speaks very well for your community. But if it's if that individual is having a bad day and they start griping about something that the the roads or something about government or this or yeah. that, and, yeah. and we all have our gripes, but. Oh, yeah. But, but they do. So they, it's, that goes back to that windshield tour. They do their own. It's not unusual for a company, if they're looking at several communities, to actually subscribe to the local newspaper. Now, mm. you know, the news has to, they have to provide the news. But yeah. when you have crime at the headline every day of the week or Scary. quite often, yeah. yeah, that doesn't look good. But now, unfortunately, on the upside of that, we're not alone. That's right. You know, it's so, uh, but, but, you know, we do have a lot of great stories that are in our local media, and so it's great when they come out. But so they, they do. They're looking and researching. They don't take everything uh, John Swope says. Uh, they, they believe me, but they also know I'm here to sell. I've had, uh, in economic development, you do get occasionally the consultant or the person that's looking for a site comes in, and just about the, one of the first things they'll say is, uh, one way or the other, they'll, they'll reach out and say, I really don't want to hear how great things are. Tell me the facts. Exactly. You know, we're, we're, we're the here. soft spots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tell me what's going on. And, and uh, of course, it, it, the, the, the first part of any visit, of any contact, is all specific to sites and buildings, labor, utilities, and all. It's all related to that operation. So that's how you make the short list is you've got a site or an industrial building or the infrastructure, um, other components, parameters to the project that are important that meets their needs. Then they begin to broaden out to, to the more softer issues, you might say. Still critical. But, but And I think you make a good point with, with crime. I know recently I was at a conference, uh, participating in a conference here in North Carolina, and, and one of the things that was announced uh, that was discussed at the, one of the opening sessions was there had been a number of crimes committed in the area. And this was a very upscale area at a Hilton, and, and I thought, uh, you know, a number of people, just you could just see the expression on their face as you looked at these three or 400 people. Wow, you know, it was almost a sense of fear. So it does have an impact. There's an impact on everything that happens, what the wording says, what, it, what the implication is, more importantly, what folks take away from it. You know, it's, um, it's, it's critical. So I think what I want to kind of move to with that in mind is infrastructure, and I'm going to touch on that for a minute. We've got a lot to cover, but I, I think it's important we touch on infrastructure because we're not talking about ju just roads, we're talking infrastructure relates to technology piece, a number of issues. How do we set as it relates to infrastructure? Are we in good shape, low on the totem pole, we need to move up a little bit? What, where do we set on infrastructure? Well, to give a little background on that, you know, back in the, again, the old days of economic development, mm -hmm. the business moved, compared to today, they moved a bit slower. So uh, it might take a company months, if not over a year, 
to finally select a, a location. And that gave a locality, a county or a municipality, time to get the water and sewer, uh, maybe a road to a site. Where today businesses are in such fast turnaround of making a decision. So if it's not unusual for us to hear that we're going to make a decision in 90 days or less. And so if you don't have water, sewer, or gas, or roads at the site, then you're not being considered. So that's, our, that's a challenge for every locality. Now, one of our greatest assets is Interstate 40, because uh, and interstates are, in our business, gold. You know, you can't replace an interstate. If you don't have it, you wish you had one. So we have 40, and then, of course, we're right next door to I-95. Our challenge with Interstate 40 is we have four interchanges, and we kind of adopt uh, exit 364, NC24, because that's we have the rail corridor, and and that's an opportunity for for uh, industrial sites. But our four interchanges in Sampson County have limited capacity to develop for industrial purposes. And what I mean is, on the northern side, uh, the Newton Grove exits of 341 and 343 do have Newton Grove water and sewer. But we have a challenge. We haven't been able to find any large acreage sites. Um, now, on the southern two exits, 348 and 355, we are able to find large acreage sites, but we don't have water and sewer there. And if you're riding down the interstate and you, you go by an exit that has absolutely nothing there, well, it's one reason might be uh, they don't have water and sewer. But when you stop at an interstate exit and it has hotels, restaurants, all types of tourism type things, um, they have, they've, I guarantee you they have water and sewer. So that's the first big step. So we are recruiting and working with companies that might be the larger type companies that do two things. First is the larger they are, the longer the time frame to complete the project. So they might have a year, year and a half, two years of their construction that gives us that year, year and a half to build water and sewer to their site. Mm -hmm. The other thing it does is larger projects tend to employ more people, they have larger investments, and we can get more grant monies from state and federal sources. So if it's 10 employees, we might only be able to get a couple hundred thousand dollars. If it's 100 employees, we might be able to get a million or two million for water and sewer. Hold that thought. We'll come back in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with John Swope, Executive Director of Economic Development. We'll be back in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with us. We should know it's only air. And again, we're talking with John Swope. He's the Economic Development Person here in Sampson County, Executive Director, in fact, by title. John, thank you again for being here. We talked about infrastructure and, and a number of infrastructure issues face you every day, technology, roads, rail, all of these things. Um, one of those pieces as we look at infrastructure deals with uh, the energy side of it. And let's talk about some of those uh, uh, projects that have come to fruition here. One of those, of course, is uh, Chemtex, the Chemtex project. Let's talk to that and we'll just kind of segue from, from uh, I guess, infrastructure, technology right into Chemtex. Tell us how that came about, how we got that project and uh, some of the rigors of making that happen. Well, we could easily make an hour show out of that. I'm but, sure we can. And, and let me also say that I, I really sh can't say that it has come to fruition. Yeah. It's in the process of doing that. But it looks very good. It looks very good. Uh, probably we'll have uh, an announcement on that, I would think, say, in the month of December. But Chemtex is a company that will utilize what's generally called energy grasses. So these are specialty grasses that are grown, and they will be used to uh, produce ethanol uh, biofuel. So they're using the energy grasses instead of corn or any other food crop. They will not use food crops for this ethanol biofuel. And so Chemtex is a, an international company. They do have a U.S. headquarters, fortunately, here in Wilmington, North Carolina, because that makes it convenient for us to meet and work together. Uh, they are owned by an international company from Italy, the M&G Group, which is the world's largest, excuse me, second largest producer of PET, which is a synthetic resin that's used, we would say plastic. Mm -hmm. And so they, they manufacture clear plastic bottles for water, soft drinks, uh, other liquids, foods. The, the goal of M&G in the long run is to replace using petroleum for making these bottles with make, using plants, again, non-food plants. And part of that process, the technical process, goes through and makes ethanol. So this plant will make ethanol. It's uh, located just east of the city of Clinton on NC24. So when you go out on 24, when the four-lane highway becomes two lanes, the site's on the south side of 24. It will be uh, it produced 500,000 gallons, excuse me, no, 20 million gallons of uh, biofuel a year. 
It'll employ 65 people, be a $150 million taxable investment. Uh, they will probably start construction, I would anticipate, if everything goes as it looks like it should, in December, and it'll take about 22 months to construct the facility. Uh, Chemtechs themselves are an international engineering company, but they, their parent company, along with Chemtechs, their engineering company, has designed this process to make ethanol biofuel from grasses. Now, one of the benefits to our region, including Sampson County, of course, is farmers who have undervalued farmland that aren't really producing uh, food crops on it, such as spray fields from irrigate hog lagoon mm -hmm. spray fields. Uh, can grow these energy grasses where they might be grown Bermuda now. And if it's, it's an alternative that if they're not utilizing their Bermuda for, say, their own cattle stock, they can grow these energy grasses and they should be making more money than growing Bermuda. So that's going to be an opportunity Perfect for day. them to convert to that. Yes. So it's a great fit for our region. Plus the, the ethanol issue is a, is a concern for farmers as well because when you look at ethanol and if corn crops continue to take up ethanol, it's also taking up feed as it relates Absolutely. to livestock. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, well, you can understand, J.W., if I brought in a prospect that was used corn for uh, producing biofuel, uh, they'd run me out of town. Yeah, so, pushback but, would be the, the yes, word, I think. Absolutely. And I've been against that, using yeah. using a food crop for energy. That, that competition between the two is, is shouldn't even be there. Uh, food and, and fuel are two different This two sounds different like a perfect fit, John. Is safety issues, are, are there any environmental safety issues that folks should be worried about at all with that? No, because, of course, they have to meet all the state and federal standards. Um, it's, they, are not, they will not be a, a polluter that, that, you know, beyond what the standards are, the regulations. Um, it's a very clean operation. They describe it somewhat like, well, it's, it's actually a large still. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And except for they don't, you know, I guess a point in the production of uh, grain alcohol, uh, either you go one way and make alcohol or you go the other way and make a fuel. Absolutely. Well, they, they go the other way. And as a matter of fact, they have a process at the very end where they dilute their finished product so they cannot be consumed because so, they are not a, 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 a consumable product, mm -hmm. not an alcohol product, they're a, a fuel product. Mm -hmm. So they actually will dilute it with a, a, a substance that will not allow you to consume it. And I guess that probably is required by the law. Is, does it, this uh, project require a considerable amount of electric energy to, to process to make the product work? Is there other fuels that's required to make it I'm moving they, forward. Uh, I'm not sure of the usage of electric, but they will be a large user. They will use natural gas. One of the beautiful things about this particular site it is it has uh, water, existing city of Clinton water sewer. It has natural gas and electricity within reasonable distance. Now, uh, the city of Clinton is being great to work with. They will have to upgrade their water and sewer service lines and, and infrastructure in that part of the, uh, the city. Uh, and they are applying to and they're receiving grants from federal and state sources. Uh, we have received a grant uh, to improve NC24 to three lanes to continue it on so that that'll improve, that'll facilitate trucks turning in and out. Uh, we have also received grants for the rail service, the Clinton Terminal Railroad improvements to have a rail spur to go into the site. And in total on that project, we've received, let me look at my notes here, of grants, um, 2.7 million so far, and it may be as high as 4.4 million dollars in grants. And when when you say grants, we can also interpret that as incentives no, to that, come in. That, that, that would be actually thing? that would be that would be separate. So okay. the, the Chemtex as a company has been, <clears throat> excuse me, incentivized by the state of North Carolina okay. to produce this plant to generate this plant here. Well, we're fortunate to be able to have that plant. What other things do you see as a, a plus by having that? Oftentimes when you get a new industry or a new company in, there, there are offshoots to that. Are there other things that may be happening as a result of that that could be locating here? Well, one of the great benefits will be that, that the Chemtex themselves will make between 12 and $15 million annually in purchases in the region, primarily of those energy grasses. So that's new revenue to our farmers. They, in turn, will, will you know, they pay their bills. Uh, they, they pay to a lot of local businesses. Uh, they buy a lot of products themselves. So that, that's a big trickle effect throughout our, our Sampson County and the entire region economy. So that's a benefit. There will be several hundred construction jobs here for 22 months. 
so that, that certainly is a benefit. There will be support jobs for the transportation of their, inf of their feedstock going to the plant, these grasses. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a lot of purchases they'll make in the region. So that certainly will be a benefit. So we're excited by the, 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 the impact the company will have. And of course, again, 65 jobs to the average salary would be $48,400 a year. And most of those jobs will be available to local people. Now, they're going to have to, most likely, well, they will have to go to a com the community college for a training course specifically for Chemtechs. And we'll be, they'll be working on that as in the coming months. Uh, but it'll be a great career, great job. These are the kind of plants that are long term. You don't build a $150 million plant and close it down in three months. They work on contracts. So uh, these type of operations have multi year contracts with their customers. And so that assures them of their revenue and assures us that they're going to be here over the long term. Huge trickle down effect. Absolutely. Huge trickle down effect. I want to uh, quickly move over to an, another industry that you've been able to, to get here, a biomass uh, yes. operation. Tell us what that is. Well, it, we've, we're, we have been working with for well over a year, about a year and a half with a company named Inviva. They are the largest exporter of wood pellets. Uh, out of uh, exporting wood pellets out of the United States. Um, that's a little unusual to people. They're not really uh, too familiar with why wood pellets are being used, but the European Union countries have become tremendous customers of wood pellets. The European Union itself is mandating that 20% of the coal that's used by European Union countries be, be replaced with renewable energy, and a wood pellet is a perfect re renewable uh, energy replacement for coal. And so, Inviva and other U.S. companies are are gearing up to meet that demand. And Inviva is the largest. A lot of people are concerned about the use of our forest in, in North Carolina and across the United States. But uh, there's a lot of a lot of research that shows that we have a more than an abundant amount of forest product. Uh, and what Inviva will do is they don't use the prime lump part of the lot tree because that goes towards lumber. Uh, that, uh, other types of wood products, furniture, but what they use is that, that end product that's often left in the field. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a, a field that's been logged, and it, the, some people call it, it looks like a moonscape, yeah. well they'll go in there and they can use a lot of the chips, a lot of the treetops, a lot of the, the bark, a lot, a lot of that parts that, that, aren't, that aren't usable. Mm -hmm. So it's really going to create an increased value to the, to the landowner that, that, that is growing their uh, forest for, as a crop. And Get a it's little going extra to, bang for his buck. Exactly. Right. So yeah. their income won't come just from from the the premium part of the tree, but it'll come from the less valuable part. In the past, less valuable, and it's creating more of a value. But uh, Inviva will uh, is proposed, and we're working with them on a daily basis to bring this to fruition. But uh, they would build uh, a plant that would be an investment of a minimum of 95 million, and it could be well over 100 depending on the cost, the end cost, uh, and they would produce 500 metric tons of wood pellets a year, mm -hmm. and they would be exported out of the port of Wilmington. They, would, they are slated to create 79 jobs at an average annual salary of $39,000, so we're very excited about that. Theirs would be about a one-year construction period employing over different phases of that construction upwards of 600 people on a construction site. Uh, they would have trucks going in and out, so that's a lot of, a lot of uh, truck driving jobs. So it's good that the community college several years ago started a truck driving training program. We've got a lot, lot going on, John, and I, I would just say that when I look at this, I think about the dynamics of what we talked about at the beginning of the show. A lot of these things have been worked on for some time mm -hmm. and are now coming to fruition right here in Sampson County. It's because of the good work you do, the folks that you work with, all of those partners you have out there. So I, I think when we look at this uh, to our farmers, uh, the Chemtex project, or this Inviva project by the mass, if they have any questions, they can just call your office, correct? Absolutely. Well, we want to thank you again for being with us uh, today as we look at various things that's happening in Sampson County. We've talked about a proliferate of, of information and hope we hadn't overwhelmed anybody. These two projects are critically important. So, again, moving forward from this, um, we'll get you back as these things come to fruition. Thanks for being here. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, you've been watching We Should Know. We've been talking with John Swope, the Executive Director of the Economic Development Commission. We appreciate you listening. We'll see you next week on the radio. Thank you.
you for tuning in to this week's episode of We Should Know with host J.W. Simmons. If you have a question or comment regarding this or any episode, please send your email questions and or comments to jwsimmonsedu at gmail.com. And remember to tune in every Tuesday afternoon beginning at 2.30 for another informative episode of We Should Know.